Hi again everyone, Raskas here with the AP Physics 1 Review 2020 kicking things off with Unit 1, Kinematics. So in this video I'm going to go through an overview of the unit. I'm going to summarize the content. Looking at the syllabus for the essential knowledge and specifically learning objectives and kind of summarize these into key points while pointing out common misconceptions and bringing it home with some practice questions in which we get to apply the science practices as the EP likes to ask you to do. So this unit is broken down into two topics. The first one is really about understanding the concepts. What do we mean by position, velocity, and acceleration? The second one, representations of motion, is heavy on, on graphs but also about understanding the equations and how these represent motion. Now, a point to note, normally this would account for up to about 15-16% of the AP exam, but in this year's shortened syllabus, this one unit can account for almost up to a quarter of your exam. So that's good to know. So let's go ahead and take a look at the syllabus in more detail. Here we have topic 1.1, position, velocity, and acceleration. The essential knowledge is really just definitions of displacement, velocity, and acceleration, including equations. It talks about reference frames. We'll come to that idea. It talks about forces and the types of forces. Not hugely significant for this unit, but somewhat relevant. It talks again about inertial reference frames. And then there are the kinematic equations. So this is essential knowledge, but these equations are provided on the equation sheet. Interestingly, even though this doesn't technically come up in this unit, it does mention the connection to rotational kinematics, as well as UCM, or Uniform Circular Motion, which really is a part of Unit 3. Now let's look at the learning objectives. This is again what you really want to focus on because the essential knowledge isn't that much. But what do you need to do with it? You need to be able to express the motion of an object using narrative, mathematical, and graphical representations. So three ways that you can express or describe the motion of an object. Then there's a learning objective about being able to design an experimental investigation of the motion of an object and analyze experimental data again on motion of an object and these are the three learning objectives they're just repeated here and that's it for unit 1.1 so let's take a look at 1.2 1.2 representations of motion the enduring understanding here is really just the definition of acceleration but under 1.2, under the idea of representing motion, the learning objective is really about using representations to analyze the motion of a system qualitatively and semi-quantitatively. What else do we have? Make predictions about the motion of a system and then create mathematical models and analyze gra graphical relationships. So if we look at it as describing motion, that's how I describe kinematics. And so when I teach kinematics, I teach that there are three ways we can describe motion in words, in numbers, and with pictures, graphs. And these are how those three ideas line up. The equations kind of straddle the two points of 1.1 and 1.2, but the words, Understanding the meaning of those words, that's what 1.1 is about. And then using these representations is what 1.2 is about. So some of the key concepts are the idea of vector versus scalar, the idea of reference frames, the distinction between linear, circular, and angular motion, the distinction between distance and displacement, again, vector and scalar, speed and velocity, acceleration and the idea that acceleration is always a vector but there are different types of acceleration if the acceleration which is a change in velocity is due to changing direction because remember velocity is a vector quantity so if the direction changes the velocity has changed that by definition is an acceleration so you can go at a constant speed change your direction and you have just accelerated 
That type of acceleration is called centripetal acceleration. There's also linear acceleration, which is what we tend to think of traditionally as acceleration, speeding up, but it can also be slowing down along the same direction that you're moving. And then there's angular acceleration, which we'll deal with when we talk about unit seven. Under the mathematical equations or mathematical part of it, you need to know the kinematic equations. You need to be able to correctly interpret scenarios and identify variables. We'll talk about this and then use these equations and relationships in a skill called QQR or QQT, qualitative, quantitative reasoning or translation, as the case may be. Under graphical representations, there are three types of graphs, position, velocity, and acceleration versus time. You need to be familiar with the shapes of these graphs and be able to describe them. You need to be able to understand slopes, intercepts, and areas of these graphs. And so here are some common misconceptions. First of all, cutting across all three, reference frame. Now, there is a difference between an inertial and an accelerated reference frame. An inertial reference frame is, for example, on the Earth when you're still, when you're not moving. If you are accelerating, you perceive things differently. We're not going to get too much into that right now. At this point, reference frame can be thought of as defining your X and Y. Now, you may define your X and Y differently according to your situation. We'll get more into this with dynamics. But the main idea here is that for vector quantities, X and Y are independent and plus and minus mean direction. What does this mean? It means that if something is moving in the X direction, that has nothing to do, has zero effect on its motion in the Y direction. It also means that, for example, negative acceleration doesn't necessarily mean deceleration. It just means an acceleration in the opposite direction to whatever direction you chose as positive. So getting more specific, common misconceptions. It's really impossible to describe position without relating it to some specific point. So that's the idea of reference frames there again. Distance is not the same thing as position. Position is in relation to some point. Position is a vector quantity. Distance is just how far away. And you cannot be a negative distance away, but you can be a negative position. Just a reminder that delta always means the final value of something minus the initial value. So change in position is the final position minus the initial position. Okay, velocity is not displacement over time. That is only true if it is a constant velocity. That can also give you average velocity, but it will not give you the actual velocity that an object is moving at, which is called its instantaneous velocity. If an object is accelerating, if there is an acceleration, we have to use the kinematic equations. Again, if an object is accelerating, V is not equal to delta X over T. It's not true. V is going to be equal to some expression that you get from the kinematic equations in which you have to factor in acceleration. Okay, on to acceleration. A negative acceleration is not a deceleration. A negative acceleration means an acceleration in the opposite direction to whatever direction you defined as positive. So if I call down positive, and I can if I want to, then my acceleration due to gravity would be positive g. If I call up positive, my acceleration due to gravity will be negative g. It depends on what I define as positive. You can define positive in any direction that you want, although there's usually going to be some reason to it. Now, as for deceleration, deceleration means slowing down. An object slows down if its acceleration is opposing its velocity. So if its velocity, if it's moving this way, but its velocity is changing that way, it means this velocity is getting less and less, and then it's going to turn around. Now, if this is negative, my acceleration is negative and my velocity is also negative, I'm going to be speeding up. I'm not going to be decelerating at all. So deceleration or slowing down is when acceleration and velocity are in opposite directions, but that direction could be positive or negative. Another one, A is not equal to G. A lot of students randomly put in equations, A is equal to G, and they keep working from there. A Y, which means acceleration in the vertical direction, 
if y is defined as vertical because it does not have to be back to the idea of reference frames a y if y is vertical will be g if and only if force of gravity is my only force so if there's nothing else acting on that object if you have an object on a pulley and it's falling down accelerating down but it has a string attached to it and there's tension in that string it will not fall at an acceleration of g the other force acting upward would be opposing its motion would be reducing its net force and therefore reducing its acceleration note that acceleration in the x direction is never equal to z to g unless it's some weird coincidence also if we have acceleration due to changing direction that's called centripetal acceleration and that's given by your v squared over r whether or not that v is constant instantaneous acceleration centripetally is going to be equal to your v squared divided by r where your r is your radius of curvature okay so going into more detail kinematic equations now for kinematic equations we have five variables four equations with any three variables you can find the other two and that's really key now these four equations three of them are on the equation sheet and i've put a picture there the fourth one comes from the definition of average velocity which we just mentioned average velocity is what you get when you divide your change in x over t if an object is accelerating average velocity like any other average can be found by adding up two velocities and dividing by two and so if you put those two together you get this fourth equation change in x over t is equal to v1 plus v2 divided by 2. This again, like all of these four equations, assumes that your acceleration is constant. So that's your fourth equation. Now, just a quick note, these equations on the left refer to linear kinematics and they have angular equivalents, which we'll come to in unit 7. These angular equivalents for delta x would be theta, v would be omega, a would be alpha, on the equation sheet, there are two equations for angular kinematics. You can get the other two by making the substitutions as necessary. Now, the key is, if you have three variables, you can find anything else that you need to find. The trick is in identifying those variables from the question that you've been given. For example, if a question says from rest, that is physics code for my initial velocity was zero. If a question says it slows down to rest, again, that's physics code for my final velocity is zero. Saying free fall implies that force of gravity is the only force and therefore your acceleration in your y direction is going to be equal to g. Again, there's no acceleration in your x direction if x is horizontal and fg is the only force because fg acts vertically constant velocity means that there's no acceleration so you can use your v is equal to delta x over t for that one and return if something returns to where it began this implies that its displacement is zero so if that's in the x direction delta x is zero if we have a projectile that is shot and returns or it's asked if if, if you are asked where does it land if it was shot from the surface of earth that is implying that it re it left the surface of earth and returned to the surface of earth so that tells you delta y is zero so on to 1.2 representations of motion this includes the equations we just mentioned and also graphs so you should by now be aware that there are these three types of graphs and if something is not moving your position time graph would be flat at whatever value corresponds to where that object is. Of course, it's not moving, so its velocity should be zero. And if it's not going to move, its acceleration will also be zero. Now, key concepts here that the slope of your xt graph is your velocity and the slope of your vt graph is your acceleration. All these lines are flat, so all the slopes are zero. Hence, zero velocity is your acceleration. What if we had a constant velocity? If we had a constant velocity, that means that our position time graph is a straight line. 
our slope for a straight line is a constant value. So that would be giving us a value on our velocity graph, but our velocity is not changing. So it will be a flat line at whatever value. Again, the slope of a flat line is zero, so we have no acceleration. What if we had an acceleration? If we had an acceleration, then we get a curve on a position time graph. We get a sloping velocity graph. We get a flat acceleration graph. Now it's really important that you have a good understanding of what these graphs mean and how they represent different types of motion. So here's a fun simulation. You can find this at PHET called Moving Man Simulation. And in this, if you click charts at the top here, you get to see these graphs for different motions. You can set the positions, velocity, acceleration. So what if I have a negative velocity, negative 16, and a positive acceleration? Positive acceleration, does that mean it's going to speed up? Well, I'm setting him with an initial velocity that's negative. So if you're paying attention, you should be able to predict what's going to happen. Let's see. So if you said he slowed down, you were correct. He slows down until he stops. But if that acceleration is constant, it means he's going to continue to accelerate positive 8. Now he has turned around and stopped. So he's at zero velocity. If he accelerates from rest, he's going to now speed up. And so he's changed direction. And now his velocity, as we can see here, has crossed that zero line. It's now positive. So its acceleration is positive. His velocity is positive. He's going to speed up. And it has a nice sound effect, comic relief. So play around with this if you need an under to better understand how these graphs represent different types of motion. One more point that's worth mentioning is that the area beneath or between these graphs, at least for velocity and acceleration, between the graph and the x-axis has a meaning. And for velocity, the area between the graph and the x-axis is equal to the distance traveled. And for acceleration, the area below the graph is equal to the velocity at that point in time. So if we look at the velocity time graph, and I'm, I apologize because this graph goes beyond the bounds of the plot area. But we started, if you recall, at negative 16. And this crosses at 2 seconds. So the area there would be length by breadth divided by 2. 16 by 2 divided by 2 would be 16. And if we look at that, at the distance time graph, we'll see that he turns at around 6 meters, at exactly 6 meters. Actually, we can play this back. And I can play it in slow motion. And we'll see that he turns at exactly negative 6 meters, but starting at positive 10, that means that his displacement was, would you say 16? Actually negative 16. Final minus initial would be negative 6 minus positive 10, which would be negative 16. So he has moved 16 meters in the negative direction. And that is accounted for by this area being in the negative area of the graph, below the x-axis. On, by the same uh, me method, we can find that he's going to move 16, positive 16, for the next two seconds. And so if we look at the area below the acceleration time graph, we can see that his acceleration was 8, and therefore the velocity that he should have after, for example, 2 seconds should be 8 multiplied by 2 which would be 16, except that he started with a negative 16 velocity. So this actually gives you the change in velocity. The change in velocity was positive 16. Negative 16 plus positive 16 change means that at that point, he was going at 0 meters per second. After another 2 seconds, he would be going at positive 16 meters per second. So this is an example of how we interpret these graphs. So that is everything that you need to know that's all the content for unit one which again for the year 2020 may account for up to 23 percent of the ap exam you need to be able to understand the meaning of these words you need to be able to be able to use these mathematical equations and understand shapes slopes intercepts and areas for these three types of graphs join me in the next video where i go through some examples of how we apply this content by bringing in the science practices looking at real AP Physics 1 past 
and practice question.